All right, welcome back. And this is our lecture, our SOL 7 lecture on the Civil War and Reconstruction. The Civil War, of course, you know uh, what the Civil War is, and we'll get into details about that. But Reconstruction is the period from 1865 to 1877. Uh, that follows the Civil War, um, and it is the attempt to rebuild the South. Um, Reconstruction will ultimately end in failure and usher in the Jim Crow era. Okay, let's take a look. So by 1860, all those disputes we talked about in our SOL 6 lecture have reached their peak. Remember, there's the tariff, the tax on foreign goods that the North supports and the South does not. The nature of the Union, all right? Violent conflict over slavery, Remember those compromises, the Missouri Compromise in 1820 that dealt with the Louisiana Purchase, the Compromise of 1850 that dealt with the Mexican Session where California came in as a free state and the Southwest was able to decide on their own, and the Kansas-Nebraska Act which resulted in bleeding Kansas. Remember Kansas-Nebraska Act was supposed to be popular sovereignty, they're going to vote on it, it just resulted in bleeding Kansas. A growing abolitionist movement, right? Remember, we talked about the Liberator with William Lloyd Garrison. We talked about Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. And we talked about the Fugitive Slave Act that allowed Southerners to go north and recover escaped slaves and deputize people and force them to help. Remember, free black people in the north are being kidnapped into slavery. Okay. The Civil War is going to be a very modern war. All right, um, uh, all sorts of new weapons have been introduced in the intervening period. And so on the left hand side here, you see what is essentially this is a, um, a breech loading or a muzzle loading uh, flintlock musket. And it's, it's a smooth bore musket. So the inside of the barrel is smooth and it uh, fires these round lead balls. And it's pretty inaccurate. All right, um, by the time we get to the Civil War, uh, Technology has improved. Now, rifles have been around for a long time, but the problem was that, uh, it, well, let me kind of explain to you like this. A rifle round looks like this. And these grooves sort of engage grooves that are in the barrel, and that puts a spin on the bullet as it leaves the muzzle, the end of the, of the rifle. Um, and think about the difference between throwing like a basketball and throwing a football. Which one can you throw more accurately and to a greater distance? Well, the football, of course. And it's for the same reason. The spin on that round allows it to fly straighter and farther, and you know, with much more accuracy, right? And so uh, rifle technology had been around for a long time, but the round had to be almost the same size as the barrel. So it took a really long time to load a rifle. So it wasn't a practical weapon for the average infantryman. Well, they come up with expanding rounds. Basically, when you fire this thing, this end right here would kind of flare out and expand and engage the grooves, and that would give it the spin, which meant they could quickly load rifles like this and rifles like this. All right. Um, and it becomes even quicker with the invention of the self contained cartridge, which is pictured down here. So now instead of you know, you've got to put in water, put in powder, put in the shot. Now you can fire, and a good, you know, crack infantryman can get off a few shots in a minute. Now it's all contained in one neat little package. You put it in it, and you shoot. All right? These weapons are going to be um, uh, all over the battlefield. And it's not just rifles. Artillery has come a long way, too. There are all sorts of different types of rifled artillery rounds, mortar rounds, explosive and incendiary rounds. You have the Gatling gun, which is kind of a multi-barrel machine gun. Um, you have ironclad warships, um, armored warships that are going to change naval warfare. All right. Um, you even have a submarine. Um, and this is not like the submarine you see today. You can see the folks inside. It's people powered. And the way that it attacks other ships is to use this harpoon and this barrel charge and it sort of rams that barrel charge into the ship below the water line and then detonates it. Well, guess what? They use this thing, I think, against the USS Constitution one time. And we know today that, you know, if you blow something up near a submarine, you'll sink the submarine. So it sank the first time they used it. 
Long story short, all these advances in battlefield technology were not followed by advances in the way wars were fought. There's an old adage in the military, and that's that generals are always fighting the last war. So the generals, in, especially at the beginning of the Civil War, are going to use tactics that were used during the Napoleonic era, during older ages of warfare. They're going to be sending troops across open fields of battle with rifles, with modern artillery, and it's going to be a bloodbath. 620,000 deaths, the most destructive war in our nation's history. Let's look at some key events and key leaders of the Civil War. All right, the first key event is the election of Lincoln in 1860. Southern states believed that Lincoln was going to abolish slavery, and so you get the first seven states to secede um, in 1860 following the election of Lincoln. All right. A lot of people like to debate this. They say, oh, well, the southern states seceded, you know, they seceded to, uh, you know, uh, because of states' rights or taxes or some other silly thing. Remember, I told you guys it's about slavery. And they seceded because they thought that the institution of slavery was threatened. This is not really something that you can debate very much. They even wrote it down. When the state seceded, they wrote documents called the Writs of Secession, which explained why they were seceding. Let's read them. South Carolina said, a geographical line has been drawn across the Union, and all the states north of that line have united in the election of a man the high office of president of the United States, whose opinions and purposes are hostile to slavery. Uh, Mississippi said, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Alabama said, the election of Lincoln is hailed not simply as a, as a change of administration, but as the inauguration of new principles and a new theory of government and the downfall of slavery. And in Texas, they said, in this free government, all white men are and of right ought to be entitled to equal and civil political rights, that the servitude of the African race as existing in these states is mutually beneficial to both bond and free. They were saying that slavery benefited enslaved African Americans, which is crazy, okay? But also they're saying we're seceding so that we can keep doing that. And it goes on. I can show you this for every state that seceded. We seceded to keep the slave. Okay. The first shots of the Civil War. All right, one of those, remember we talked about Fort Monroe and all those coastal defenses? Well, this is another example. This is Fort Sumter. It's a coastal defense. It's, it was built to defend Charleston Harbor. All right, there's a Union garrison inside. All right, so it was a Union fort defended by federal troops in South Carolina. South Carolina had seceded, and they wanted Lincoln to remove the troops. Lincoln can't do it. If he removes the troops, He's acknowledging that the, that secession is legitimate, that the Confederacy is a real thing. He can't do that. Those troops have to stay. They needed to be supplied. Lincoln said, I'm going to send a supply ship. I'm just giving them supplies, but I'm not sending in more troops or reinforcing them. Well, um, the Confederates used that as a signal uh, to attack. And so PGT Beauregard, the Confederate commander on the ground, opens fire, they shoot at Fort Sumter, right? Um, uh, uh, ultimately, nobody is killed. The only person that dies, dies afterwards when an unexploded um, round blows up. Uh, but these are the first shot to the Civil War. Another important event of the Civil War you have to know about is the Emancipation Proclamation. This is issued after the Battle of Antietam. Um, Lincoln uh, basically tells the states in rebellion, um, you have a hundred days to cease rebellion, come back into the fold, or all the slaves within your territories are henceforth and forever free. So this was done for moral reasons, but also strategic reasons. Essentially, Lincoln is saying, stop your rebellion, or all the slaves in your territory are free. Four million of the nine million people that lived in the South at the time were enslaved African Americans, all right? So this is a, a powerful move by Lincoln. All right, let's look at a couple of battles, a couple of key battles. One of the key battles of the Civil War is the Battle of Gettysburg. This is the key turning point for the Union, all right? 
Now, Robert E. Lee has been given a lot of credit as being a, a brilliant military commander, and to a certain extent, he was a good commander, but Robert E. Lee is over-reliant on crude frontal assaults. That's his thing. He just divides his forces in the faces of a larger enemy, and he attacks, and, and that works early on in the war because the Union generals weren't very good. Well, by the time we get to 1862 the Battle of Gettysburg, Robert E. Lee is up against George Meade and some better generals. But Robert E. Lee is going to do the same thing he's always done. He's going to rely on crude frontal assaults, and it's going to cost him big. All right, so the Battle of Gettysburg begins when a, there's a Confederate detachment that's searching for Sears. That starts a skirmish with some Union pickets. It eventually grows into a massive three-day battle that includes 51,000 casualties, and it is a decisive Union victory. It's the key turning point. After Gettysburg, the Confederacy has lost. It is done, right? And the Union is winning and taking ground. All right. Um, one very important aspect of the Battle of Gettysburg is Pickett's charge. Um, and uh, Robert E. Lee, like I said, he was uh, over reliant on crude frontal assaults. The Union had occupied some high ground along the ridge. This is Cemetery Ridge, right? Little round top here. They had occupied this key ground, all right? And so Robert E. Lee ordered Pickett and his uh, 15,000 men to assault the Union lines. Well, this is all open terrain. There's not a lot of places to find cover or concealment, and it's about a mile from here to here. So this is a ridge line lined with guns and cannons, fields of fire, interlocking fields of fire. It's a kill zone. This is a kill zone. Robert E. Lee is ordering 15,000 men to march across that kill zone and assault Union high ground. They're fortified. That's crazy. His subordinates, Robert E. Lee's subordinates, said, that's not a good idea. We shouldn't do it. He told them to do it. Guess what? It was a disaster. When Robert E. Lee gave that order, the Confederate Army was done for. The Army of Northern Virginia was crippled. It limped back to Virginia, a shadow of its former self. Okay. This is William Tecumseh Sherman. He uh, initiates something called scorched earth warfare um, in Georgia. So Sherman was a Union general, all right, and he said, war is the enemy, or war is the remedy that our enemies have chosen, and I say, let us give them all they want. So he's going to, um, uh, his approach to war is something called total war, or scorched earth warfare. This means destroy everything, military or civilian property that can be used to support the Confederate war effort will be destroyed. War is the remedy. So we're going to give them all they want. Burn the crops, destroy the railroads, burn down the plantation houses. Let's break the will of the enemy to fight. The best way to remember this, Sherman's neckties. So what they would do is they would, you know, the Confederates didn't have a lot of railroad mileage. And railroads were really important um, during the Civil War for logistics. So they would get the railroad ties and they would pile them up. And then they would lay the railroad rails on top of the ties and make a big old bonfire. And then they would wrap the heated ties around trees. They, that way the Confederates couldn't come back afterward and rebuild the railroads that they had ripped up. And these were called Sherman's neckties. So remember Sherman's march to the sea, where essentially he marched a, a kind of swath of destruction across Georgia. All right, the final kind of key event of the Civil War, the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. And in 1865, Robert E. Lee surrendered to uh, Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse here in Virginia. Robert E. Lee's army was hungry. Uh, they were waiting on a supply train that was not coming. Um, they were practically out of ammunition, and Robert E. Lee realized it's done. This ends the Civil War. All right, Jefferson Davis was a U.S. Senator, and he ends up becoming president of the Confederate States of America. Now, here's the thing, guys. What you got to understand, and, and a lot of times we think of the Confederate States of America as an actual thing, it was never actually a nation. The Confederacy never existed except in the minds of the people that seceded. No foreign country ever recognized the existence of the Confederacy. 
Lincoln never recognized the existence of the Confederacy. That was U.S. territory, and those were U.S. citizens. They were in rebellion. So Jefferson Davis was not actually the president of the nation. He was rebelling against the United States, but he was president of the quote-unquote Confederacy. All right. Ulysses S. Grant was a Union general. All right. Grant rose to prominence. He started off the war as a lower-ranking officer, but distinguished himself as a capable leader and ended up being the overall Union commander in charge of the war effort. He's a Union general and he won victories over the South after several other Union commanders had failed. Lee was a Confederate general. He was actually a, an Army colonel in the U.S. Army. He resigned his commission to fight for the Confederates. And he was against secession, but he stayed loyal to the South um, and didn't believe the Union should be held together by force. All right. This is Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was a former slave who escaped. Um, ended up becoming a very famous abolitionist. Um, and so Frederick Douglass, one of the stories you get from him, he talked about how um, he learned that his mother had died. Uh, but uh, the news hit him the same way it would if he heard that a stranger had died because he never knew his mother. The only relationship he had with his mother, he was a child on one plantation, and she had been taken away from him and was on another plantation. She would sneak out at night she could have been killed or beaten for this. And she would sneak to his plantation. She would lay in the bed beside him just so that she could be with her child for a few hours. And then she would sneak back to her plantation before the sun rose. So that was his childhood, right? He goes on, he escapes, becomes a prominent abolitionist, and he ends up meeting with Lincoln and encouraging Lincoln to allow African Americans to enlist and fight in the Union Army, and 200,000 African Americans do. They fight to save the United States. All right, well, let's look at Lincoln, the Emancipation, and the Gettysburg Address. All right, so Lincoln saw the U.S. as a nation, the United States, not these United States. He said that we are a nation, not a collection of sovereign or independent states. He famously said, a house divided cannot stand. Lincoln said that this nation cannot endure half free and half slave. It will be all one or all the other. All right, and he said, he said a house divided cannot stand. Southerners believed that the states had joined the Union and so they could free the Union. But remember, we're bound together under the Constitution. So after Lincoln is elected, he's immediately facing one of the toughest challenges the president has ever faced. He's got to keep the country together. In his first inaugural address, when presidents are elected, we give an inaugural speech. Lincoln's up here. He's giving his inauguration speech. He says, in your hands, my fellow countrymen, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. Lincoln's number one goal, keep the union together. His second goal, end slavery and extend citizenship beyond just white males. Okay, so as the Union advanced into Confederate territory, um, slaves were given something called asylum. So they were given protection. Uh, places like Fort Monroe, they were given protection. But they were called contraband. Contraband is considered confiscated property. It's like if you take your cell phone out in my class, that's contraband. I confiscate it from you. The slaves that were given protection, that were given asylum, were considered contraband. They were considered property that would be returned at the war's end. Okay? That's a big problem, guys. We can't fight a war over slavery and then go back to slavery after the war. All right. So Lincoln's got to deal with that. He's also facing problems with France and England. France and England might recognize the Confederacy in previous to be a big problem. Lincoln, therefore, is going to issue the Emancipation Proclamation that will free slaves in the states of rebellion. It doesn't actually legally end slavery, but it ends slavery. He's going to use his war powers to end slavery in the states of rebellion. By doing this and making the war about ending slavery, France and England are out. They are against slavery, and they will not support a war to keep slavery. Right? Um, this is also going to encourage 200,000 African Americans to invest and fight for the Union. As a result, the major goal of the war becomes to end slavery. 
Great Britain and France say that we're not going to recognize the Confederacy, and African Americans enlist to fight and fought and fight they did. African Americans have fought in every war in our nation's history. Okay. All right, so here is that famous Battle of Gettysburg. I told you guys already about Pickett's Charge. Remember, these are fortified Union lines, cannons, infantry units. Look at all the artillery. It's all ranged on this field. And Robert E. Lee says, hey, guys, I want you to charge across this meat grinder, assault the Union lines, and, and break through the Union lines so that we can roll them up. The Confederate Army of Northern Virginia is decimated in this attack. Robert E. Lee tenders his resume. He tells Jefferson Davis, I need to resign because I failed big. Jeff Jefferson Davis says, well, you're all I got, so you can't go anywhere. That's Pickett's charge at the Battle of Gettysburg. The Gettysburg Address is a speech that Lincoln gives after this very famous turning point battle. Gettysburg was the key turning point, the decisive victory for the Union. Lincoln goes there after this battle, and you've got to kind of picture it, right? The battlefield is still covered in the bodies of soldiers that fought and died there, all right? Lincoln sees this as he's going to make this speech. He wasn't even the keynote speaker for that day, by the way. There was another guy that talked for like two hours, and nobody remembers a single thing he said because Lincoln gave a two-minute speech that became the most famous speech ever given by a president in our nation's history. All right, Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address describes the Civil War as a struggle to preserve the nation and create a new nation in which all men are created equal and a government that is of, by, and for the people. Let's take a look. Oh, and by the way, you can see Lincoln here. And look, who is his audience? He's surrounded by soldiers. That's his audience, the troops. All right, let's take a look. Lincoln said four score and seven years ago, he's talking about when the Declaration of Independence was written. Um, our founders brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. So he's saying, hey, our founding fathers made a nation that's based on the idea that all men are created equal, and now we're fighting a war to see if you really can have a nation where all men are created equal. He says, we're met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who gave here their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. So what Lincoln is saying is, we're on this battlefield because we're dedicated. So they were actually turning the battlefield itself into a cemetery. Because so many people died there, 51,000 casualties, remember. But they said, we're just going to make this a cemetery and bury the people right here. And he said, the men that, that fought here died to make a nation where all men are created equal. But Lincoln says this, in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow, make holy, this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggle here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. So what Lincoln is saying there, he's saying, we can't dedicate this ground because the men who died fighting here already did that. There's nothing that we can do that's greater than that sacrifice that they made on this field of battle. He says, he goes on, and he says, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion to the thing they died for. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. So what Lincoln was saying was, we can't dedicate this ground because those soldiers dedicated this ground with their blood. Our job after this battle is to make sure that they didn't die for nothing, 
Our job is to make sure that we create the nation that they died to preserve, right? Powerful words. You can see why he talked for two minutes and he was interrupted by applause like 10 times. This is the most powerful speech ever given by a president in our nation's history, and you can tell why. Lincoln, powerful speaker. Let's look at the contributions of African Americans, common soldiers, and women during the Civil War. So African Americans serve in the Union Army and Navy following emancipation. 200,000 of them did so. Now the, so. now the SOL tells you that they were paid salaries equal to those of white soldiers. That's not true. That's an inaccurate statement. They should probably fix it. They were paid salaries that were less than white soldiers, and they had to protest um, in order to get equal salaries, and even when they got equal salaries, they weren't given back pay for when they weren't being paid equal. So for years, for a long time, they were paid less. And then finally, toward the end of the war, they were paid the same, but they didn't get back pay for the pay they missed. So that is, that's, the SOL is inaccurate in saying that. Um, before emancipation, they served in what were called contraband armies and aboard Navy ships. After emancipation, they fought, they enlisted and fought. They used the opportunity African Americans did to secure their freedom. So as the Union Army was coming in, African Americans left plantations and went to Union lines. All right, Frederick Douglass famously said, once you let the black man get upon his person the brass letters, U.S., let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket, um, there is no power on earth which can deny that he has earned the right to citizenship. Douglass was saying, these guys are fighting and dying for this country and that means they are citizens, equal sense. All right, African Americans continued. They faced racism, of course, in the war. Um, and they faced added danger. Confederates said that they would execute black soldiers. So normally, if you're captured in a battle, you're made a prisoner of war, and you're supposed to be treated right. The Confederates said that they would execute black soldiers and the white officers that led them. And this happened all the time. There's a Confederate general named Nathan Bedford Forrest. There are statues of Nathan Bedford Forrest around our state. But what people don't know or don't realize is he ordered the murder of 400 unarmed black troops at the Fort Pillow Massacre. After the war, he went on to found the Ku Klux Klan. He's not somebody that deserves an honored place in our society for sure. These, these soldiers, said, uh, not Nathan Bedford Forrest. All right, they had to fight for equal pay. Um, and they face racism even among their ranks. All right, for the common soldier, warfare was brutal. Remember I said this is a modern war, all right? This was trench warfare before World War I. Um, they, you know, they had modern weapons, and there was a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat as well. Look at the bayonet. They would fix this on the end of the rifle. They would have to get down in the trenches and stab each other with this. Soldiers on both sides returned with permanent disabilities, Many soldiers in the South return home to find their homes destroyed. All right, you can see, um, you know, some amputees. I actually could see these guys in lost rooms in the war. Um, battlefield medicine, this guy lost his hands. Uh, battlefield medicine was not great. Uh, battlefield hospitals were nasty places. And a lot of times, if you got a, extremity wounds, if you got a wound in your leg or in your hand or your arm, they usually just amputated it. I have a, a couple of friends who fought in Afghanistan and Iraq um, that I deployed with who are amputees. They have been able to lead a somewhat more, I have a, a man I know, uh, Nicholas Ramp, he had his leg taken off by an IED, he has a prosthetic and, and is able to enjoy a pretty normal life. These guys did not have that. Um, and a lot of them uh, went back to their homes in the north and the south and became beggars on the street. Um, and we're not treated very well. Remember that the rounds that are used are new and powerful. So this is about the size of a uh, little bit bigger than a 50 caliber bullet. When it hits you, it spreads out, flattens out, and produces just some really nasty wounds. All right, so a lot of really, uh, the casualties were, were, were awful. And even those that survived were permanently disabled. All right, so for the average soldier, all right, it wasn't constant combat. Back during the Civil War, uh, the soldiers re referred to combat as seeing the elephant because it, it was almost like they would wait and wait and wait. They would spend hours at camp, right? Days, weeks, months, 
seeing no combat. And then all of a sudden, it would happen, right? So long periods of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror, all right? The odds of dying in combat, if you're a Union soldier, you got a 1 in 18 chance of dying in combat. I don't like those odds, right? If you're a Confederate soldier, there's less of them, right? So you got a 1 8 chance of dying in combat. Casualties were very high. Women fought in the Civil War as well. We know that 400 women served uh, by disguising themselves and fought in the Civil War. Uh, this is what they had to do back then. Fortunately, today, women can fight if they want to fight. And our military has, has done away with restrictions as far as gender goes, and rightfully so. Speaking from experience, women have served with distinction in combat since our nation's conception. And, and they have every right to serve right alongside their male counterparts. Women at home managed homes and families with scarce resources. They faced poverty and hunger. Uh, there were bread riots in Richmond. Thanks to the inept leadership of Jeff Davis, the bakers in Richmond, because Richmond was cut off, they didn't have supplies. And so the bakers in Richmond were charging like ridiculous prices. They were taking advantage of people's suffering um, to make a, make a buck. So that so the women in Richmond rioted. They smashed the you know um, baker shops and took the bread. Jefferson Davis came out and like uh, basically had no ability to quell the bread line. He actually offered the ladies that were protesting at the state uh, house in Richmond a, a loaf of bread. That just made him mad. Um, Jefferson Davis, not a good leader. Um, women also assumed new roles. Assumed new roles. They worked in agriculture, and nursing, and war industry. And they're going to redefine womanhood. What you guys are going to see is with this war and each following war, the role of women in society is going to change. Civil War, World War One, World War II are going to have the effect of increasing women's rights. Keep that in mind. All right. So Reconstruction, we're going to talk about the 10% plan, Johnson's Reconstruction, and the Radical Republicans. Let's take a look. So after... Uh, Lee surrenders to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. The war ends. All right. The southern states are occupied by the Union Army. They have military governments. Lincoln believes secession was illegal and that Confederate governments were not legitimate. Remember I told you, in Lincoln's eyes, there never was a Confederacy. Jefferson Davis wasn't the president of anything. And all of those Confederate leaders were just rebels and criminals. But he says, Lincoln believes, rather, the fastest way to rebuild the South is to quickly restore their state governments. You don't want to be governed by the military. Lincoln wanted things to go, people to go back to work, to pick the South up, get it back on its feet, get it working again, heal the wounds, and get the nation running again. So he comes up with a plan. It's his 10% plan. He says it's 10% of the state's registered voters pledge loyalty to the United States, then they can elect new leaders. They can't put their old Confederate leaders back in charge, but they can elect new state leaders and get rid of the, the military government. Remember, Lincoln wants to quickly restore governments in the South. All right, Lincoln believed that to reunify the nation, it was important to not punish the South. Lincoln did not want to punish the South. Lincoln said, and you guys need to know this quote, that we need to act with malice, malice is hostility, meanness, with malice toward none, with charity for all, to bind up the nation's wounds. Bind means bandage, so to bandage up the nation's wounds. His opponents were radical Republicans. They were in Congress. They wanted a more strict approach to Reconstruction. They didn't like Lincoln's 10% plan. All right, but Lincoln was a powerful leader. And so with Lincoln in the White House, the 10% plan was going to be the way to go. But Lincoln is assassinated by John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater just three days after Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in 1865. His vice president is Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson is everything Lincoln is not. He's the wrong guy for the job. Johnson is going to fail, and the radical Republicans are going to take control. Johnson... Lincoln's vice president succeeded him. All right. Johnson was from Tennessee. He was one of the few um, 
congressmen who didn't go over to the Confederacy when the South seceded. And uh, Lincoln kind of picked him as a vice president as sort of an olive branch of the South. Well, Johnson is going to be very sort of um, uh, against equality for African Americans, and he's going to allow a lot of Confederate leaders to get back in charge. So he kept most of Lincoln's plan, but he pardoned high ranking military and Confederate leaders as long as they asked for it. Remember I told you about Nathan Bedford Forrest. Nathan Bedford Forrest murdered 400 US troops. They were unarmed. Johnson gave him a pardon. That means legally he said Nathan Bedford Forrest didn't commit a crime, right? Once these Confederate leaders got back in charge, they instituted black codes, which were rules that were designed to bring back slavery and take away citizenship from African Americans. So here we just fought this horrible destructive war and Johnson is undoing everything that it was fought um, uh, to uh, sort of, well, we, we fought the Civil War to get rid of slavery and now Johnson's gonna allow it to come back. The black codes uh, said African Americans cannot own property or guns, said they couldn't vote, um, said that uh, an African American who did not have a job um, could be arrested. Let me erase that so you guys can see it. I drew my lines kind of fine. This last one here, he said that African Americans who were unemployed, who didn't have jobs, could be arrested and forced to work for no pay. Well, I told you guys, 4 million of the 9 million people living in the South during the Civil War were enslaved African Americans. And the South was devastated by the Civil War. Where are those 4 million people supposed to find jobs in the 1860s? They can't. And so what this is designed to do is just bring back slavery. Leaders in Congress were angry. They wanted to remove every trace of the Confederacy. And when they saw former Confederates coming back to Congress, they were enraged. So the radical Republicans are going to take control of Reconstruction. With Lincoln gone, the radical Republicans are going to challenge Andrew Johnson's authority. Radical Repu Republicans put those Confederate states back under military governors. They said, okay, you guys want to institute black codes. You guys want to go back to the way things were. We're sending the Union Army back in, and we're going to resume military occupation, which means the Union military will be the government. The radical Republicans are northern members of Congress. They wanted a strict approach to Reconstruction, and they wanted to ensure citizenship for African Americans, aggressively guarantee the right of blacks to vote and be equal citizens, of black Americans to vote and be equal citizens. They clashed with Johnson. Johnson did not want black people to be able to vote. He did not want them to be equal citizens. So they impeached Johnson. They almost removed him from office. They miss it by one vote. During the early phase of Reconstruction, we already get the first African American members of the U.S. Congress. They so quickly get elected, especially in states like Mississippi. And so you see the first African American members of Congress. Reconstruction is going to fail, though, and this uh, is not going to continue, unfortunately. So, political and economic effects of the Civil War, let's take a look. We get the 13th Amendment. These, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, by the way, are known as the Civil War Amendments or the Reconstruction Amendments. The first one, the 13th Amendment, permanently abolishes slavery. The 14th Amendment ensures equal citizenship. It says states are prohibited from denying equal rights under the law to any American, and citizenship was redefined. 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law. I talked about the 14th Amendment a little bit. Remember I talked about the Lovings and how their 14th Amendment rights were violated. The 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law. We are equal citizens. The 15th Amendment says that voting rights are guaranteed regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So this overturns the whole Dred Scott decision that says that even former slaves get to vote. All men, any race, get to vote. Note that women are not included in this. Women will not get the right to vote for many, many decades uh, to come until the passage of the 19th Amendment. More on that later. Following the end of Reconstruction, 
those former Confederates got back in power, all right, which is going to usher in the Jim Crow era in the South. The term Jim Crow comes from a, it's a racist, what's called a minstrel show. Uh, and, and minstrels were like people that paid like, played like a violin or a fiddle and would do like a little kind of act to entertain audiences. Well, a Jim Crow minstrel show was a white actor in blackface who would then act out racist stereotypes about black people to entertain white audiences. It's a really ugly thing. So Jim Crow is, uh, refers to the era and the laws that are created in the South to disenfranchise African Americans. Remember I told you guys, franchise means to vote. So if you disenfranchise someone, you take away their voting rights. So Jim Crow laws are going to do this through intimidation, through poll taxes, and through poll tests. They're going to be all sorts of ways where they're going to try to stop African Americans from exercising their constitutional right to vote. Civil liberties are going to be restricted. African Americans are going to be segregated and denied social and economic equality in the South for decades to come, and we're still dealing with this. We're still dealing with the failure of Reconstruction. We still have these problems. We still have social and economic inequality across the nation because of what happened during Reconstruction. Economic effects, the southern states were destroyed. They had been devastated by the war. Remember, farms and railroads and factories had been burned down. Richmond had been burned down. Atlanta had been burned down. Uh, the South's economy had become dependent on slave labor. And with that gone, they didn't have anything to replace it. Many of their working uh, men had been disabled in the war. So the South is going to remain poor and agricultural for decades to come, all right, because of the failure of Reconstruction. This is not the case. In the North and the Midwest, those industrial economies are going to drive growth. A lot of people are going to leave the South, especially African Americans are going to leave the South and go north to these growing industrial cities. And we're going to see a major demographic shift um, in the decades following the Civil War. This is going to lay the foundation for the industrialization of America over the next half century. After the Civil War until 1900, the United States is going to undergo a transformation that is going to make it the most wealthy, powerful nation in the 20th century. All right. Uh, one last thing, uh, following the Civil War during Reconstruction, we complete the Transcontinental Railroad. And I'll talk more about this in our next unit. But essentially what happens is two companies start. You've got the Union Pacific um, and the Central Pacific uh, Railroad. And they start to build toward each other, right? Um, and they're laying the Transcontinental Railroad. So these are all the existing lines. And essentially what they want to do is link the West Coast with the East Coast. So they start to build toward each other, okay? And they need a promontory rock in Utah. And then it's a very big kind of to-do. There's a golden spike with a telegraph wire attached to it so that they can hear the last hammer strike of the Transcontinental Railroad all over the world. Um, and I'll talk about this later, but uh, many of the workers on this end of the line were Chinese workers. Many, many Chinese laborers came to help build the Transcontinental Railroad. We also had African Americans and Irish workers helping build the Transcontinental Railroad. So this is a, a project that is accomplished by former enslaved African Americans and immigrants um, and really speaks to how this nation has been built by um, uh, you know, uh, people of color, by people who are immigrants to this land, um, and, and it's a really kind of inspiring thing. All right, and it links East and West and it's gonna drive industrial growth. Okay, so that concludes our SOL 7 lecture. Make sure you do the discussion board, make sure you read the narrative and answer the questions, um, and make sure you fill out those guided notes. And I'll see you guys next, guys next.